Hi, this is Dr. Gideon Burton. I wanted to make a little video tutorial for my students as they're looking ahead to doing a research paper for me. In this case, a research pa paper for my Shakespeare course. I think that a lot of times students, as they are uh, mapping out their calendar for what they're going, their deadlines for the semester, uh, they don't always give a lot of conscious thought to what happens between the time when you have done your reading of a work of literature and then when you're actually completing the finished research paper. So what I want to do is, is lay out those interim steps and then provide some suggestions for how to develop in the early stages a good solid idea for one's research paper. So my first suggestion is, and I've, I've written out a little worksheet here, which is something that you know you can imitate if you'd like, um, but the first thing I've indicated here is that you should plan out your paper. You should have some kind of a development calendar. In this case, um, I've, I've laid it out as though there are four weeks uh, to work on a paper. And these are the stages that I recommend, you know, loosely speaking, for the type of research paper that I would assign, which is going to be an eight to ten page research paper. In week one, you're doing more uh, just brainstorming and initial writing and development. Well, that's what I want to really get into now is, is how you can do this early stage that might be happening in, in weeks one and two. So I've on this Shakespeare paper development page, and it, you know, maybe you're not writing a paper about Shakespeare, but just take it as an example. Um, what I have, I'm going to explain to you the different sections that I have as this this worksheet that's just going to help me to make sure that I am developing it in its early stages in the best way possible. So. Um, at the very top of this worksheet, week, worksheet after I've created my development calendar, I have listed possible themes or angles. And this is where I am going to write down ideas that will ultimately lead to a claim, some kind of thesis. But it's, I don't expect myself to have that claim initially. But I want to give myself a space where I could start to, once I do get some ideas from some of these other areas I'm going to talk about, that I'll come, at, come back up to here and perhaps just in a bullet list kind of way list uh, you know various themes that I, I'm thinking about or various angles uh, first angle on Hamlet and, and I might go on and explain that I'll show you as I go along but I think you should have some place where you, you're, you're ready to record your main ideas now how do you get to those main ideas well there are a lot of sources that you can go to and the first of these, the most important of these, and I'm speaking as an instructor of literature where I expect my students to be uh, reading and analyzing literature and, and bringing that to bear within the research paper. The, the primary source is the primary sources. And so as you are trying to prepare your possible paper ideas, you should go back and review your textbooks, your, uh, in this case, if someone's analyzing a Shakespeare play, they should go through and look at what they may have underlined. And I think it's actually very useful to um, actually write out some of those or copy out those quotes and put them right here. These might be chunks that you then use later on in your paper to support your ideas. You don't know yet because you don't know what your paper is going to be about. But I think for literary students, you've got to get in the habit of immediately grounding your paper in the texts that you're working from. This is where you're going to have, you know, you, you want to avoid the problem of editorializing or just kind of talking vaguely from the very beginning of the concept of your paper, you want to work from the primary texts. So um, let me pull up an example of this from somewhere else. All right, so here, here you see an example where I have um, started to collect quotations from various Shakespeare plays on the theme of madness. And so there I have the, the actual quotation from the text. I've included a reference to it so I can find it. And then you see in brackets above that, this, this is just my own convention, do what you want, but I think it's helpful as I'm going along to just kind of make a note to myself of you know what this quote supports or what theme it is in the service of. So here this, this uh, quotation from Merchant of Venice, um, is, is about the mystery of madness, and then this one from Midsummer Night's Dream is about madness tied to love, um, and uh, there's another uh, theme 
on madness and love from another quotation on madness and love from as you like it and so th this has been cold from my my reading partly it's been cold from my reading of secondary work and and so here's where I want to make some important distinctions you want to base your literary research paper on literature so you must spend time in the primary text you must quote from them analyze them they've got to be there but oftentimes you can be aided in getting to the best primary text by way of secondary texts so I'm, I will show you how that worked out here um, a student of mine referred me to this particular article about Shakespeare and madness and so what I did here is I I listed the the source I'm not bothering to give a complete MLA citation on this but I'm giving it enough of a citation that I know what it is and can find it again especially if I have a link that I can take to it so this Will Tosh has written something about Shakespeare and madness and so as I went to that He's the one who um, got me onto this quote from The Merchant of Venice that's about um, madness and kind of melancholy uh, uh, tied to that. And it, it's, um, I'm interested in looking at this person's ideas, their own interpretations, but at this point, um, I want to look at it to see how it can take me back to the primary texts. So there's a lot of ways that you can go about making use of secondary texts. This is not the only way, but one of the ways of using the secondary texts is to get you back to the primary sources. Now, I would just add here that we don't want to just depend on how others have culled things out for us. Um, you want to make sure that you're spending time within the actual um, text itself, especially if you have been highlighting or making notes either in on paper form or in electronic form you can go back and review the texts and find quotations let me show you an example of how I do this in electronic form alright so now I'm I'm wanting to demonstrate the way that I go back through my edition of this text this literary work to see things that I have highlighted along the lines of this theme so this is my uh, Kindle version of this New Oxford Shakespeare edition and the play Hamlet. And as I was reviewing uh, Act 3, Scene 1 of Hamlet, uh, this is where I saw uh, Ophelia talking about Hamlet and referring to how that noble and most sovereign reason like sweet bells jangled out of time and harsh, uh, his mind is, is blasted with ecstasy and that that um, on the same page I also noticed where the king said madness and great ones must not unwatched go and happily f when you take notes with the Kindle app you can find those notes and export them and put them into something like a Google Doc okay so now I'm looking at the, the um, my notebook from Kindle I go to Amazon read.amazon.com slash notebook if I'm logged into my Amazon account then it will take me to my notes and highlights and so here we can see those um, those quotations that I had found on the page so I'm gonna copy those over here as additional uh, ideas for my theme of madness in Hamlet. Okay, now you can see where I have included these two quotations that I've drawn from my own reading of the play. And I'm going to put a little, uh, you know, heading, subheading, a little note to myself about what this is all about. And, and so here is, um, I'm just going to, Ophelia responding to Hamlet's madness and I'm also going to just add a, an insight that I had on this from one of my students so classroom discussion I'll get to that later as an, being a separate source but um, and that is that maybe Hamlet's 
being suicidal uh, ends up planting that idea for Ophelia. That was, wow, that's an interesting concept. Maybe I want to follow up on that. Maybe I won't, but I'm giving myself a note as to why that is interesting to me. And then the other quotation here was, uh, let's see, uh, the King Claudius remarks on, I can't spell King Claudius, King Claudius, there we go, King Claudius remarks on why madness is problematic with leaders. Okay? Now, I don't know. Am I going to write a paper that has to do with leadership or with Ophelia? I don't know. But the point is I'm gathering together passages that, that seem to go along with the theme I'm interested in or that seem to be um, meaningful to me personally in some way. I'm not writing my paper yet. I'm just trying to get st some the same kinds of things trying to get into the same room the things that can energize me to really go somewhere and those primary sources are critical for that all right so I I recommend that you do something like this if you're working off of a paper book you you can go through a similar process and actually in the process of looking what you might have scrawled in the margins on paper and copying your notes or the quotations from that primary text over into an electronic document gives you a chance to process it and think about it and that can be where you can put in an annotation like I'm putting in in brackets here um, take advantage of that um, transfer process to do some reflection okay so um, what have I done so far I've made a development calendar I've made a space where I'm going to start putting possible themes or angles and then I started going to some of my sources for ideas and the first one I went to is primary sources now that I've listed some of those I'm gonna go back here to my possible things and themes and angles and list things out here and obviously in connection between um, madness and suicide uh, but I also want to put down that um, uh, maybe that uh, suicide is catching right that's a serious sort of thing um, did um, Hamlet influence Ophelia? Maybe so, and I, I put a note about that next to that primary source here. All right, well, that, that's all I'm going to, well, maybe not. It's like, do I want to have, um, is, uh, is, is love and madness something I want to write about? I'm, I'm using this place as a way to talk to myself. It's very rough. It's just a, it's a way of brainstorming, but outside of my head and taking advantage of the very fluid, um, flex flexible nature of an online document. So uh, that's all I'm going to do with those primary sources for now. And now I'm going to go down to this next section that I've, I've called secondary. And I, I already mentioned to you that I picked up on a secondary source uh, from a, a, a online discussion. So that actually goes to the next category I'll be talking about is drawing off of online or in-class discussions or informal discussions that people have had with one's peers. Now, uh, this this is a, if I want to jump to the dis discussion part, this is where I would go to look at um, either my notebook, lecture notes, or discussion notes, or if you're someone that has participated in some online discussion with fellow students, which is more and more the case nowadays, then it would be going to that. So here's an example of the, the Slack platform where my students are, have been discussing Hamlet and King Lear together. And so this is some of the discussion that they had about this. Um, one of the, the threads that was brought up over here by my student Heather um, has to do with how Hamlet keeps using the word sleep and how it seems to soften and rationalize the idea of death and particularly suicide. Um, and that is an idea that I thought was interesting. Maybe the very form of the speech about suicide is something that helps to lead one's mind to be conditioned towards that emotionally. 
And that's, wow, you know, maybe I want to talk about that. So I'm going to copy this idea and and go over here to my discussion thing. And and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to copy it as a quote. I'm going to mention who, is it Heather Talbot? Yes. Um, so I, I, uh, put it in quotations. I don't know if I'm going to directly quote her. It, right now, it's just the idea that I think is really compelling. If I do end up using it, I want to make sure that I refer to her because it's perfectly legitimate to refer to one's peers and fellow students as sources, as long as that's not the only sources you're using, but give credit where credit is due. And I put just a little bit of an annotation here so I, I could remember where I found it. So here's an example of drawing upon online discussion to help me develop an idea, um, perhaps borrowing or building on what some of my fellow students have, have talked about. Now, I'm going to go back here to secondary. There are, broadly speaking, two kinds of formal secondary sources for literary research. There are sources that are directly criticism of, analysis of the work or the author that you're studying. So if I'm studying Hamlet, I could go to Hamlet Studies or many of the places where uh, the play Hamlet is, is uh, discussed and, and criticized in scholarship, and I could start looking into that. Let me just do a very quick version of that to show you how this could be part of the brainstorming process. Notice I'm talking about the early development stages. I'm not talking about the kind of full-on research process, which I think comes later. But I, I think it's important to understand that you can do some minimal early general research and that is something that will help prime the pump. And, and you can even work from the basis of really just scanning titles or, or um, summaries of works rather than getting too far into the nitty gritty uh, so that it's still just kind of prompting your general thinking. Now I was, I was saying just a second ago that there are two, generally speaking, two kinds of secondary sources. And the first was direct analysis of the literature in question. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. But the other type is what I call a general research resource. And this is where it's not talking particularly about that particular play or that particular author, but it might give you a more general view. So it could be uh, something that, in, in this case, might take me to Renaissance England. I could look up um, something about Renaissance literature broadly rather than just looking at Hamlet itself. And there's some real advantages for this because a lot of times the way you need to get into a paper, both yourself in the process of writing it and your, ultimately your readers in, in following your argument, is you have to come at it from some kind of context. And sometimes I think students run far too quickly to the very um, um, focused analysis of that particular literary work. Those are legitimate sources, but I think it's often very useful to go to the general ones first. So let me show you a, an example of how I do each of those. I like to make use of this research guide that my institution has prepared. <clears throat> All right, as I'm trying to look for general research sources and not specific criticism, I'm going to this library research guide about Shakespeare where I found uh, a tab devoted to different reference works and so I'm, I'm not looking for that article that interprets how Hamlet caused Ophelia's suicide. That's too specific. I'm still on a developmental level and I want to be open to some bigger connections and see some other possibilities are out there. So my purpose in going to this type of secondary source is to go broader, not deeper, on that topic. So I'm going to pick the Oxford Companion to Shakespeare. And I, I am going to search within that work to see if I can find something about madness in the Oxford Companion to Shakespeare. And what do we get? Uh, whoa, that's not what I was expecting. I thought I was searching just within that book, but hey, let's, let's run with this for a second. Um, 
I'll go back and look just within that book, but this is actually very useful for the purpose because some of the fun of doing literary analysis and research is making interesting connections among different works, not just among works by the same author, but maybe works in the same period or, or even works outside of the period or in a different form of art or something like that. So here, um, my search about madness shows that there is an entry about this in the Oxford Companion to Classical Civilization. Mm. So, you know, maybe Shakespeare was drawing upon longer traditions of depicting madness from antiquity. Okay. Uh, madness in public health. I don't know. Um, madness um, is, uh, again, going to classical studies. Madness in the Bible. Huh. I haven't really thought about that. I know there's a lot of religious references in, in biblical references in Shakespeare and, and even in Hamlet. Is there a connection between madness and religion and Hamlet? See, this is exactly the zone you want to be in where you, you're, you're stumbling across potential areas that you could develop further. So, you know, even at that, I could stop. I could go back and say, hey, may, maybe something I want to do here in my possible themes is to think about uh, madness and religion. Uh, are they connected in Hamlet, maybe? Uh, okay, so I'm just putting my question there. and Maybe I, I uh, copy out this source, or maybe I don't. Um, I'm just trying to think of possibilities. Madness in a dictionary of gender studies. Wow, well, I mean, we have the difference in uh, Hamlet's potential madness, Ophelia's possible madness, there's a gender angle on here. I could I could look into that. Uh, madness in the Romantic Age, huh? Okay. Well, maybe maybe um, I could look backwards. Okay. Madness um, before Shakespeare, maybe in antiquity and after Shakespeare. So in the Romantic period, because I think there was. Uh, a lot of interest in madness in the Romantic period. And th this is just, you know, I'm not taking down exact citations or anything. I don't want to get slowed down too much. I'm just trying to think of some possibilities, you know. And may maybe I do want to keep track of this a little bit. Um, so I could go back to, I've created a sources to check out thing. And, and so I could list something that like that down here. Um, I just remember what it was, the uh, Oxford Companion to the Romantic Age. Maybe that's something that would tie in to the, that theme I'd written out above. Uh, or I could do it for any of these. Now I could drill down just a little bit. Um, well, poetic madness. Hmm. I wonder if that's interesting. Okay, so, you know, be curious, have fun, try to make connections. And it's going to be easier to do that by looking at these broad secondary sources uh, rather than the more narrow secondary sources. OK, so now I'm going to go back to this Oxford Companion to Shakespeare. And I'm going to look for madness just within this Shakespeare reference and see what I get. Well, there's 22 entries. Now I'm just going to look at the title of those entries in this general reference work devoted to Shakespeare. Doctor, wooer, hmm. so we get the uh, uh, connection between romantic love and madness. Oh, look, there's Ophelia. Uh, and that might be something I want to come back to. Something about George III, um, the Ur Hamlet, the original Hamlet. Uh, okay, revenge tragedy. Oh yeah, um, there is something about Madness being a kind of trope inside of uh, this general genre of revenge tragedy. I could follow that up on dogs. Okay. Um, William, William Butler Yeats. What's that doing in Shakespeare? Uh, oh, let's see. Uh, Yeats just talks about in his poetry poems of rage and madness in old age. Huh. Okay. So... Madness in Old Age and Yeats. Wow, that's kind of cool. That that gets me thinking about madness on another level. I've been thinking most of it in terms of Hamlet. Now I'm going to think of madness and King Lear and its connection to old age. 
and I'm going to just remember that Yates um, thing. I mean, if I wanted to, I could copy it out here, but the Oxford Companion to Shakespeare has something that connects Yates. Yates entry in Oxford Companion to Shakespeare. Now, I, you know, when you do a lot of this brainstorming and research, you just have to write down the minimal that will allow you to go back and find that source without um, bothering to give complete citations because that will slow you down and keep the creativity from developing. So I'm, that, that's good enough for now. All right, I'm going to go back to that Oxford um, reference to Shakespeare. Uh, Margaret Cavendish, I know she's important. Uh, female author in the period. Um, I don't know what these, oh, Seneca, obviously. Um, madness and Fairies? What? Um, uh, gosh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. Fairies. Fairies. Okay. So, Madness. Um, maybe I could connect it to Madness and, like, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and... And in that play, you do have these lovers who kind of go nuts. They're helped along by, you know, magic potions and things like that. But, um, I don't know, that, that could be something. I don't know. Obviously, there's going to be a, an entry about King Lear here, and that will include the discussion of that theme, um, etc. Prose? Huh. What's that? Oh, interesting. Ah. So what this is talking about is that madness is often depicted in Shakespeare's works in terms of prose rather than poetry. I know that's good to look at because I, I know it's good to connect form and theme. And so there's, I don't know, I want to do some, is, are people more sane when they're using poetry and they're less sane when they're using prose? Hmm. More sane using poetry. Okay, it's kind of fun. That's all that I'm going to do here. I hope, hopefully, you can see then that um, going to the Oxford. What was it the Oxford Companion to Shakespeare? It it gives me lots of references to to madness that I could follow up on. Okay, that's on a very general level. Now, if I wanted to do something on a more specific level, um, I could go to um, look up specific articles, for example, in the MLA International Bibliography, although one of my real favorites for Shakespeare studies is the World Shakespeare Bibliography Online. Now, here's where I have to be really careful because I don't want to get sucked in too far into any one article that's doing the analysis here, because I'm still trying to work on a kind of general level, right? Okay, so here we have the World Shakespeare Bibliography. Oh, give me a search box. Oh, is it here? No. Search and browse. Okay, so I'm going to just look for madness. Um, man, that might be too broad. Maybe I want to go back to some of the notes I've taken and, and review interesting things there. Madness, suicide, madness, love, madness, religion, madness and fairies, madness and prose. Yeah, I want to do that one. Madness, who's that song? I want to look at madness and prose. What do we got here? Give me something. Uh, hmm. Something book on the language of Shakespeare's plays. If I look at that, oh, look at this. Includes discussion of Shakespeare's expository techniques, employment of verse and prose to vary tone and atmosphere, use of irregular meter, and representation of madness. Bingo! This is going to be talking directly about the use of prose with madness. Okay, that's getting me excited. This is, this is where you have to look for the fun here is you see that someone's already gone with this idea that you've had. That's a good thing. 
because you can build on their ideas and they can sharpen your own thing thinking as well so R.A. Henderson wrote a book in 2009 um, geez I want to find this thing but I'm gonna copy this so that I don't forget it um, and let's see I'm gonna put this under my secondary sources and it's um, need a full entry but just enough that I can find it again I'm going to copy that name of that author over here and uh, I'm going to remind myself that I found it through the world Shakespeare bibliography in case I can't find it again later I can look it up there again uh, and I'm going to put in brackets here it connects prose and madness all right just so that, you know annotate what you do so you, you can remember it later on okay so I like this idea so much that I'm gonna look it up see if my library has it um, wouldn't that be cool and try to resist the temptation to go and get it from the library immediately no. all right well this is often what happens when you're doing research and I believe strongly in the serendipities of research you can kinda of have a planned serendipity and that is okay when you look for something and you don't find directly what you're looking for look at the other things on the shelf including other things on the virtual shelf of the other search results that you're looking for so I'm just gonna browse at a couple of these oh look at this the place of Shakespeare a thematic guide Wow, why didn't I think of this? Maybe someone's already done the work of culling through all of Shakespeare's works to find stuff about madness. And this is one of those general references that I could go to. All right, so I started out wanting to find some specific article, and I did find that really cool book mentioned here. But now that I've gotten into it, um, I've stumbled across a thematic guide that might be something that, that really helps me. Uh, Okay, it is online, so I'm going to look for it right now. Um, isn't it awesome that we can look at so many things full text online now? What a wonderful world we live in, and yet there's madness. Okay, so the plays of Shakespeare, a thematic guide. Here it is. I'm going to search within it. Um, I'm going to look up madness and see what we get. Okay, 84 hits there. And oh look, there's a whole entry just on madness. Bada bing! Let's go there. So I'm gonna look at this now. Um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, okay. This looks like something I'd want to spend a little bit more time with. Um, Malvolio and Madness, etc. Okay, I'm trying to resist the temptation to get down too granular because at this point, like I said, I just want to look on, in general level. Um, as we listen, we wonder about several points. Is Hamlet acting mad? Has he actually fallen into madness, or does he believe he is not mad? but has become so infused with his role that now he is mad. Okay, okay, that's something of the acting your way, acting mad, becoming mad thing, that's interesting. Um, oh, though this be madness, yet there is method in it. How could I have not remembered that quotation? Okay, so I'm going back to include that in my primary sources. Um, that's from Hamlet. So madness, you have to be method in it. So there's a kind of rationality to madness. That's kind of an interesting thing. Or, or maybe, well, I'm not going to get too far into it. I just want to keep that as a quote from a primary text that I might want to use. Now I'm going back to the secondary source. All right. I don't want to get uh, too far down into all of that. So I've recorded some additional things here. And uh, just to review what I've done, I've poked into some secondary sources, both um, 
uh, general research, mostly general research resources, but also maybe some specific criticism. Maybe I could do one more of those just to show you how that works. If I go back to this uh, resource that can take me to articles, I'm going to try the the uh, MLA International Bibliography, and I'm going to put in Shakespeare and and uh, madness and see if anything turns up. 30 sources, that's not too many. Shakespeare's Letters, The Madness of King Charles III, okay. Madness and Magic, Shakespeare's Macbeth, I hadn't thought about that. Oh, Shakespeare and the Representation of Female Madness. Now, I was looking at Ophelia here, is that something that I might want to look into better? Shakespeare, Madness and Music. Scoring insanity. Oh, that sounds like fun. Let's see what's going on with that. Uh, I wish there were a, a uh, summary of it, but maybe there will be if I can find it in my library. I'll try that out. Come on, come on. Shakespeare Madness and Music. There it is. Available for checkout. Okay, so I want to read a summary of this. Shakespeare's Three Political Tragedies, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the adaptations of Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear. Um, okay, music has long been associated with madness and was used as an audible symptom of a victim's dissociation from their surroundings and societal rules, as well as their loss of self-control. Wow. Now that's so interesting. I, I got to put this in. Could I? Could this be something that's more interesting to me than some of these other angles? Madness and music. And I just kind of want to remember what source I was looking at for that. And it's... Uh, I'm just going to write this down. Maybe I'll put it down in the sources to check out thing. And I have... Leonard, someone. Okay, I'm going to put that down here and I'm going to make a note that it's in my library so I can look that up later. Um, and the author is Leonard. So I'm writing about madness and music and I'll look at that Leonard source maybe on that. I think that's kind of cool. I Because madness could be associated with both the problem and the music could be associated with both the problem and the solution of madness. Hmm. All right, you got to have fun with this. If you don't make time to do some development in early stages, you won't allow yourself to come across some really juicy possibilities. Okay, you don't have to go with the very first thing, you shouldn't go to the very first thing that crosses your mind. You need to do exploring. So let's do some other exploring. I've looked at primary sources. We keep coming back to those and adding to them. Two kinds of secondary sources. I've looked at discussion in class or online that, that um, has prompted some interesting thinking. Another category is what I call media or informal online sources. Okay, so scholarship is awesome, but that's not the only place to get great ideas. In fact, uh, one of my students today Here's a great example of this from my student, Megan. Megan said, um, Hamlet doesn't seem to care when he arranges the deaths of his friends. And then she linked out to this Prezi presentation, which I went through and I thought, wow, that's really quite useful. I don't care who put it together. It could have been a couple of seventh graders. But what it did is it did an analysis of deception and spying. Okay, now this has nothing to do with my current research focus on Shakespeare and Madness, but I'm using it as an example, both of a source that came by way of an online discussion from peers, but also as an example of this category of media or informal online stuff. Okay, so let me show you just a couple of ways that you can do searches that are not scholarly, but could help you um, ferment some interesting approaches to your paper. Okay, so first of all, uh, it, I think it's 
it's fun sometimes to go to um, uh, media like visual media because sometimes you can get a quick sense of things in a hurry. So if I, I go to images.google.com and I put in Shakespeare and madness, what am I going to get? Huh, well, it looks like a lot of people have um, found, oh, they've made little uh, memes or images that include quotations. Some of those are taking me back to primary texts I didn't thought I hadn't thought of, like madness is the glory of life. Wow, I don't ever remember reading that in Shakespeare. Like madness is the glory of life. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to look that up in my complete works of Shakespeare because now I'm very curious. What was it again? Like madness is the glory of life. Like madness is. Okay, Time of Athens. Yeah, I hate that play. I shouldn't say that. But there is an interesting quote within it. What a sweep of vanity comes this way. They dance. They are mad women. Like madness is the glory of this life, as this pomp shows to a little oil and root. So kind of a cynical view about both women and life. Hmm, I don't know if I want to do much with that. But like madness is the glory of this life. It might be something I want to include in my primary sources. Like madness is the glory of life. This is from Timon of Athens. All right, so what what's happened here? I, I went to this very random media source and it gave me an avenue back into the primary sources. Hmm, okay. And I'm just kind of scan things to see if it might remind me of other things that might be related to Shakespeare and Madness. <laughs> Look, March Madness. Hmm. Could we do something about Shakespeare and sports? Hmm. Yeah, that could be fun. Um, well, sometimes when you look up pictures, you can find specific productions. So let's see what this is. UT, College of Liberal Arts, and somebody's crazy is this are these the uh yeah i thought it was the witches from macbeth um okay so we have this kind of bloodlust Ooh, yeah there's a kind of madness different way of talking about it too maybe madness and we've talked about madness and love but madness and lust that could be for blood or for love but you know desire out of control sort of thing. Um, okay, so that's taken me to a performance at the uh, Texas Liberal, Liberal Arts, um, UT Austin, where they did a, a presentation of Shakespeare's Macbeth, some academic production of it. Um, now, wow, that's interesting, triple casting. Um, I had meant to say earlier that there is a category, a kind of primary source that is productions. I, I want my students primarily to think of primary sources as the texts of, you know, the literary texts that they're studying. But when you're talking about Shakespeare, when it is performed, those productions are themselves primary texts, right? They're original. And even though they're an adaptation, a rendering, they they still have something original to them. And so that might be something I might want to keep track of. I could even create a separate category for that. You know, it would be, you know, productions of plays uh, that feature madness in Shakespeare. Hmm, okay. And I could write this down, that this uh, UT Austin uh, Macbeth, and I'm just going to save the link to that and put it here. Do I know whether I'm going to be talking about this in my final paper? No, I'm just giving this a shot of, you know, this is a little planting a seed of maybe um, looking at productions of plays that feature madness. Okay, so what am I doing here? Well, it started out by just looking at various media. The media took me to productions. 
productions are their own kind of primary source. And it's reminding me that there are other people that have been involved in, in a college level um, performing or studying Shakespeare. So uh, that is an excuse for me to uh, take you to another kind of informal online source besides looking up images. And that is looking up syllabi. So if you want to uh, limit a Google search to a specific domain, you use site colon and then that domain, and then you could put in your search terms. And so what I'm going to, this is going to hopefully do, is I'm going to find people who have written a syllabus, teachers that somehow are looking at Shakespeare and madness. Let's see what that yields. Well, it's not surprising that we have, oh, look at this. St. Louis University has a course on madness and Shakespeare. When was this done? 2015, not that long ago. Now look at this. This is why it's so important to recognize that informal sources can be complete gold. They save you a lot of work. They help you conceptualize things. You can take advantage of other people that are in the zone, already thinking and studying stuff, build on their work, and it doesn't always have to be through formal scholarship. Okay, Looking up a sil syllabi are not peer-reviewed. They're not published as scholarly things. They're teaching aids, right? But they can be so helpful. So I'm going to read through what this uh, Dr. Andrew J. Power put together in fall 2015 uh, at uh, what university was that again? Uh, St. Louis or something? Anyway, madness is a curiously common theme in Shakespeare's plays hmm, across the different genres, but it is complex. Yes, indeed. All right. Uh, something eternally complex. Okay. This course seeks to examine the various ways that one might be mad in Shakespeare's time to understand some of the medical conditions that might taint your mind or the emotional states that could cause you to lose your wits or the physical degeneration that could make you dote. Okay, it's also looking at theatrical traditions and different portrayals of madness. Okay, we got mad tyrants from Seneca. Oh, the rage of Achilles. How could I have forgotten the rage of Achilles? Yeah, that sort of uh, madness tied with violence. Um, all right, so I might glance over the, the texts that are there, especially if they might be things that are adding to Shakespeare. Uh, all right, and that's not that I'm not going to do much more there. Um, it did show me the early modern drama database, and maybe that's a, a source of primary text. Okay, that's all I'm going to do for there. Uh, wasn't I, I'm not going to write anything down from that, but it got my mind thinking about some other traditions, literary traditions that have to do with madness. Um, here's something from the University of Chicago where the syllabus is called Reading Madness. All right, fall of 2015. Um, W.J.T. Mitchell. All right, so this one is a course that's not just about Shakespeare, so it might be interesting to see what is being brought in besides that. Um, okay. Language and Madness. Oh, Foucault, yeah. Uh, poetic Madness. It's, it's taking me to possibly some other uh, general research resources that I might have looked at. Um, and, uh, and Freud, who I know used Shakespeare to talk about um, psychology. Hmm. Uh, madness and Language, that's an interesting approach. Poetic Madness, okay, that, that, there's all kinds of stuff on that. Um, madness and Suffering, wow, you could do some really inter interesting intertextual work here. Dostoevsky, uh, Poets, uh, uh, oh, Euripides, uh, here's the quote from Hamlet. Um, and, and from Lear, looking into dementia. Um, that's the connection it was making to Shakespeare. But now I'm interested in some of these uh, connections to um, madness outside of Shakespeare. And this person is looking at media and visual culture. And 
everything from Mad Magazine or the Mad Men series to movies like A Beautiful Mind or One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, wow. There's so many movies that depict madness. Do I want to make connections between madness and, and movies? Well, that's a fun angle. I can put this up in my brainstorming bin. Madness and movies. And I want to remember... Where did I find that? That's in this. I'm actually going to put a link to it. This syllabus um, from Chicago. All right. So this is not committing me to any of these ideas, but it's giving me a way to collect them and curate them a bit and put them into an area where I can go back and start, you know, ranking my areas of interest and stuff like that. All right, so what have we done? The the media thing, um, I you can do an image search, um, and I did Shakespeare and, and madness, um, and then I also found a uh, a syllabus. I, I'm sure there are others that could be really, uh, but that reminds me of another area that you can begin searching, and that would be blogs. These are informal, they're not peer-reviewed scholarship, but again, they're just kind of giving you some ideas. Um, instructional media is another area. Um, before I looked at Prezi, um, you can look at um, SlideShare. Um, now that's associated with LinkedIn, I don't know if it, it's sus sustaining its academic content as much, but let's just see if um, we have anything about Shakespeare and Madness that someone has uploaded as part of a PowerPoint. Wow, well, look at this. Got a lot of them. Um, wow. What do we do with that? Um, there's some unit, so maybe some teachers put together something thoughtful about Madness. And let's kind of page through this. Um, okay, looks like it's just something to explore Hamlet, but I'm not seeing a whole lot on uh, madness in there, so I'm going to give up on that. Um, you know, the, some of this stuff is just crap, right? It's the, it's the, this is the open web, and people just put random stuff up there. But that is actually a chance to be find some fertile, wild sources out there. I don't want to have just a summary from uh, that kind of thing. I'm gonna see where I'm going here. <sighs> All right, that's not particularly paying off, so I'm gonna just let it go for now. But I just wanted to illustrate that you can go to instructional media like PowerPoints, etc. And good sources for that are slideshare.net sometimes and also um, prezi.com. Uh, and I could have looked for videos. Now you can get swallowed into stuff on videos, but sometimes people will have, uh, let's just do a quick one. We go to YouTube and I look up Madness and Shakespeare. What do we get? Um, short educational video explores Ophelia's madness. Well, that might be something on, on track here. Um, Will he not come again? Will he not come again? No, no, he is dead. Go to thy death. Oh, the most beautified Ophelia. That's an ill phrase, a vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase, but you shall hear thus. All right, I thought there would be some discussion, but it looks like it's just an excerpt of Ophelia's Madness. And, you know, that could go up as a primary text under productions. Uh, I'm not particularly drawn to this, but I will just use it as an example of a different kind of... Um, production that features Madness and Shakespeare uh, exploring Ophelia video. I'll just put a link to it and 
it might come to nothing, or it might really want to come back to that, right? That's how, we're, that's how we explore. Okay, so you can look at different media or online stuff that's informal. Um, one other, there's so many places you can go. You can go to Reddit forums, for example, um, or to social media. Okay, let me give you an example of that. If you go to search.twitter.com, well, anything could happen, right? But if you if you put in there um, Shakespeare and and madness, I wonder if something will come up. Yeah, not a lot. Maybe I'll go back and put um, Shakespeare and I don't know mental health. Let's see what we get. Oh, look at that. What's this? Promoting mental health with Shakespeare through the Rose Playhouse. Well, that's interesting. What do we got? Let's see. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. So one of the things that you can do is through these informal uh, things like search, etc., is it can take you to um, people that have been exploring a particular idea, and you can actually reach out to them and talk to them. We've been looking at, for example, productions. Uh, there was that one that uh, was at Texas, and then there was the video that we just saw. All right. Well, I had students in the past that have contacted actors from various recent productions and asked them to talk about that character or that production that they were part of. And these actors, if they were reachable, were happy to talk to those students. And that made it fun. I have a whole separate presentation about socially optimizing one's research strategy, and so I don't want to cover that here. But suffice it to say that... Um, when you start looking up informal online media, especially social media, you can be taken not just to ideas, but to people, people who might be curating a set of resources, people who may have recently spoken at a conference on your topic, uh, people who are teaching your subject, and very often you can reach those people and once you're a little further along, probably not in your initial brainstorming stages, but further along, you can sound them out about your ideas, or they might become a, a source that you get to cite. Think about that. All right, that's all I'll say for, about that for now. Okay, now I have this other category here that I say, um, my life or our times. And that's because I think that it's important when students are writing papers that they find a way of connecting the papers to their own current life and what they're thinking about outside of the class they're taking and to our our times uh, our times for example um, we're currently living underneath the tyranny of Donald Trump and so I'm gonna call Trump's America as a real concern right now um, that's a reason why I assigned Richard II for my uh, students to read there's some interesting comparisons between Trump and Richard II um, but if I'm going to do some brainstorming right here, I'm not going to try to connect it to Shakespeare. I'm not going to particularly try to connect it to any of the themes. I mean, if they float into my mind, fine. But part of the, the way that this works well is, is if you kind of just let yourself um, spitball in some areas that, that just matter to you generally, and then you can work your way back to the themes that you've been exploring. Let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> so I could list other things that are going on in our, our day and age right now. Like we have this you know, explosion of, of technology and, and uh, um, we have um, uh, you know, sort of this online uh, bad discourse that is clouding our political scene. Um, what else is going on right now? Um, we we have a real concern about uh, the planet and climate change and 
so there, there are worries over uh, what we can do about that sort of thing. Um, and then if I wanted to make a, a separate list of not about our times, but about my own life, all right? And this is where you have to be, a, I mean, this is a private document. You don't have to share it with anyone. And so try to put things down there that are really make, taking up your mental or emotional energy things that you have a stake in right now like uh, let's see I have what do I have a stake in that's of a concern right now oh my wife is contemplating a career change she might get a new job and it's a very nerve-wracking sort of time right now for us does she leave a really good job to take another job will it be better what does this have to do with Shakespeare I don't know maybe nothing my point is I'm brainstorming about my life and things I'm already invested in right now. Okay, what else? Um, oh, I have some students that are, uh, are trying to work on an LGBTQ podcast. And it's, it's an exciting project, but it's fraught with problems. And it ties in with something that is personal to my life. And that is my, my son is, is gay. And we've only recently been learning about it and coming to terms with it. And figuring it out and it's a big issue and it really takes up a lot of our time and and uh, and obviously I'm, I'm touching on personal things here right and you don't put your pearls before swine you, you there are things you don't put into your research paper about your personal life okay I get that but sometimes the engine that really drives you to work in this um, more objective world of literary analysis is something that's highly subjective that already matters to you in your own life okay so it could be that it could be maybe there's a there's a health issue um, I have a, a, a family member that's that's having real difficulties with their health and I'm very concerned about her um, and I have a um, my sister this is not funny it's not funny <laughs> okay it's it will be funny uh, my sister was attacked by a moose okay I can't even type it in here sister attacked by moose what could this possibly have to do with Shakespeare writing a paper maybe nothing but I'll tell you what this is on our mind right now because she could have been killed and she got all roughed up and so did her jogging friend and what a crazy world that all of a sudden one day your sister gets attacked by a moose what what happens there okay what am I doing I'm listing things that matter in the larger community or country. I'm listing things that matter in my own life. And now I'm going to pull back and rub my chin a little bit and say, okay, do any of these, can I connect any of these things to Shakespeare or even better to, to madness? Well, let's see. Trump's America. You know what? I just don't want to talk about Trump. So I'm just going to set that one aside. Um, climate change. Wow. Yeah. What is it that you know, I'm going to start writing just a couple ideas, just in case. Um, um, what, what madness that people don't trust science anymore. What What's going on? You know, this, this, this is a real problem for us nowadays. Okay, I made a tiny connection here. I don't know if I'm going to develop it, but um, people can be in a state of denial uh, uh, about reality or they can be um oh i was reading this morning about a, a a colleague of mine who has bought into one of these crazy uh right-wing conspiracies and it's like do i approach her about it i mean we're not at the same institution but i it's like i want your life to be happier than believing in and what was a QAnon conspiracy what's going on when educated people with phds are believing crazy right-wing conspiracies people Okay, I look at some of these other things. Could they have anything to do with Shakespeare, my wife contemplating a career change? My wife's a very strong-willed woman, right? And uh, 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 we have lots of strong female protagonists and characters. Um, let's see. You know, I don't think I want to talk about my wife. But I put it down because it mattered. Now I'm going to move on. Uh, students working on LGBTQ podcast. Um, there's a oh man, there's so many troubling issues with that. That um, uh, secrecy and ignorance 
in so many settings um, cause serious mental health issues. Okay, secrecy and ignorance, you know, I, the Macbeth and the witches or something. Like that. I, I could probably start connecting that to Shakespeare, maybe. Um, my son being gay, it's, it's uh, uh, to me and my wife, it's much more about staying connected as a family than it is the homosexual, heterosexual issues. Uh, it, it's, it's challenging um, our religious paradigms. Or from a you know a faith tradition that doesn't smile on that, and yet we have the son we love, and coming to terms with that is tough. And I believe in literature as a way of um, being equipment for living, of helping us to mediate and come to terms with things. Um, where do we see a challenging of paradigms happening in Shakespeare, or or maybe there's an example of someone that goes crazy because their paradigm gets shaken. Um, Oh, there's a uh, Twelfth Night. It has these twins, one boy, a girl, and they switch places. And then you have someone falling in love with the, the twin of the wrong gender. And then at the end, they switch. And so it's sort of like, I don't know, that sounds like a stretch. I'm going to let it go. Health issues, sister attacked by moose. Oh, please, give me a way to talk about this with Shakespeare. Mm hmm. Let's see. Well, we have there's the uh, I thought of Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, who gets changed into having the head of an ass. That's the immediate connection I'm making. Not sure where that can go. Um, there's the Winter's Tale, where you have the most famous stage direction of all time: exit pursued by a bear. Oh, maybe there's something to that. Um, this is from the Winter's Tale. And um, there's some serious madness going on here. And it's going to be Leontes' um, madness and irrationality uh, and jealousy about his friend and his wife and unfounded things. It's, it's like worse than Othello. Um, and it takes place in a very, um, this, this is a romance, and so you have spectacle and kind of incredible things that go on like you know a bear coming on stage and eating somebody um, and uh, uh, there's there's something well the, the insight I'm getting as I'm thinking about it is maybe there's a connection between um, romanticism and madness wait wait didn't I see that up above um, yeah didn't I uh, Oh, man. Oh, yeah. The Oxford Companion to the Romantic Age had something about... Um, uh, oh, there's madness before Shakespeare and in the Romantic period. So maybe um, this could help me work on an idea of... Um, I'm going to put it up in the top section now. Um, madness as a uh, romantic... Thing, not in terms of love romance, but in terms of being um, idealized or dramatic, uh, kind of l not having verisimilitude, because it's kind of exaggerated, and romances generally are, are like that. Yet Shakespeare grants his things in, in, in verisimilitude, and so that could be an interesting tension between whether is madness something that is, is, is it's um, is madness stereotyped and and therefore it's kind of this romantic thing it's it's in the realm of crazy coincidences and shipwrecks and being pursued by a bear uh, or is it grounded in real life experience um, and I even put Leontes mad uh, jealousy versus the maybe the more realistic uh, Ophelia's descent into madness as a jilted lover. Okay, what am I doing? What am I doing? I have gone from looking at my personal life, my sister being attacked by, thank goodness she's okay. That's, that's all I can say, except for those 
hoof-shaped bruises on her arms and her legs. But anyway, I've gone from talking about my sister being attacked by a moose. <laughs> oh gosh, oh you poor thing. Um, to to making a serious connection to a, a way of thinking about Shakespeare and, and madness in a way I hadn't thought of before. And, and it connected back to some of my earlier thinking. Okay, can you see what we're going on? I'm having fun here. And the de early development of your paper, you got to make some space for you to have some fun, including some personal fun. And you got to go to these different fishing holes until you get some fish that are bouncing around. Okay, so I did that by going to primary sources. I did that by going to various kinds of secondary sources. I did that a little bit by looking at some interesting things that were said in online discussion. I did it by looking at various kinds of online media. And I did it by plumbing some of the issues of our day or my own life. Now a final category that I want to put down here, and um, something I don't think students think too much about, but maybe they should, is my paper's future. So. Uh, I've already set it up here. You you might think in terms of what you might be doing with this. Uh, maybe you'll get a chance to present it or publish it. And well, why does that matter now? When I'm a, I don't even know what I'm writing about. Why would I think about that? Because if you can think of a realistic audience for what you have to say, so that you're writing for that audience and not just for your professor, then you might tap into something that's more authentic, more important to you, and more important to that audience. So think about uh, how could this matter to someone? Hmm. Well, if I go up to that prior section here where I was talking about my life and our times, um, I think about, as I think about my son and his being gay, and, and the, just the terrible challenges faced by people that are, uh, you know, in our society and yet sometimes we're blind to them in society and the, the, the human costs of, of ignorance and prejudice and uh, you know I, I would love to write a paper that would help people gain more understanding of and tolerance for homosexuals because that matters a lot to me right now I mean I volunteer at a place where that, that serves um, homosexual youth and and uh, cares for them and it's, it's very sobering to see how much of a need there is there I'm not saying that I'm going to write some Shakespeare paper and, and mail it out to my gay friends. But you know what? There are ways that you can connect with audiences that matter on these topics. And if you start thinking about it now, it really could shape the way you develop your paper. Because it can give you a better purpose. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big social issue like homosexual rights or something like that. But... Let me give you another example from a different student. I had a student who was really into video games, a Shakespeare student, okay? And he had his eye on going to graduate school in video games. Didn't even know they did that sort of thing. Okay, he actually ended up doing this. But he kind of worked his way backwards because he had that longer goal of uh, influencing critical discourse about video games. I didn't know there was critical discourse about video games, but he introduced me to it, and there is. Anyway, he's thinking he found people at conferences and on blogs that were doing close readings of video games like someone might do a close reading of a poem or a novel. And it's like, I want to be part of that. And so he ultimately did take his paper about The Tempest as video game and he presented it at a regional uh, conference. I think it was up in Seattle or something like that. And uh, good for him right? So if you can think of how a given topic might either be of importance to a given audience or it might open a door for you, it might give you a way of, of deciding on your various possibilities, helping you narrow in a more constructive way. Uh, students are, are often thinking about how to um, build their resume and, and one way to do that is to build out a, a portfolio of works. How does this paper on Shakespeare, how could it figure into your future job search. Okay? Um, just think about that. Maybe it has absolutely nothing to do with it, but if if you think, oh, well, you know, I want to be a, uh, a teacher one day, uh, well, maybe you do a research paper that is focused on, I don't know, uh, performances of Shakespeare in elementary schools or um, um, 
differences in teaching units about Hamlet or something like that. Be pragmatic about this sort of thing. What would look good on your resume that you'd done some serious research on? Yeah. And that could be true even if you're going into medical school. I have an English major right now who is going into medical school in her future. Very determined. Good for her. And, uh, well, hmm. Wouldn't it be interesting then to think in terms of um, uh, an investigation of Shakespeare connected with medical practices from the Renaissance? Man, that's that's a great topic. In fact, uh, Stephen Greenblatt is, has taken that topic on, among others. Um, it is a good topic. And it might be something where she's preparing for a future interview. And they're trying to sort the difference between so many qualified people in the sciences going into medical school. And she sets herself apart from the other people applying because she can talk about, I don't know, bloodletting in the Renaissance and tie it into her interest in phlebotomy. Hi, I'm back. I got cut off there uh, last week when I was recording this by the very student I was talking about, the medical student the, that's an English major. Anyway, one of those things. I just had some final thoughts now about, um, as I was just saying, about planning one's paper in terms of where it might end up, what future it might have. And maybe some students, they like, oh, I'm not ambitious that way. I'm not going to uh, present at a, at a conference or something like that. I hope students today are a little more interested in doing that. The opportunities are bigger than they ever used to be for undergraduates, uh, usually local conferences and so on many different ways that you can distribute your paper and um, at the very least you can email your paper out to people that might be interested in it and why not? So I do hope that my students will think about for whom and it could be you know people who are your your homies and friends like your your parents or maybe your former teachers that that might respect something that you're writing about um, but but also it might be for um, uh, specific uh, audiences that care about a given topic. You know, if I'm discussing madness, then it might be um, mental health, um, uh, health uh, professionals, or uh, uh, just people who have been open about their um, own uh, mental health issues. Uh, you know, obviously, you you want to be careful in how you address audiences, and uh, but when you're writing a, a professional paper, it's not like you're using the second person, but you're you're writing something that um, you're imagining audiences that would care. That and the thing is, you should imagine that audiences that care. Consistently, I see my students underestimating the interest that people have in the academic work that they are doing. And they don't realize that them putting together interesting thoughts, connecting them to literature, opens up people's minds and helps to shape their opinions. It changes the world. So don't underestimate yourself. Think about people that could be changed by how you are addressing something. It might cause you to maybe take on a more serious topic or a more focused topic. And that's, that's the whole idea is to achieve a, a kind of authenticity for your paper. So it's not just tied to you know getting a grade in a class, but maybe actually changing the world. And it doesn't have to change everybody's world. Uh, you can just, you know, modestly share your paper with a few people and it might make all the difference to them. So think about those people. So for whom you do it and also where you might uh, uh, have some kind of an outlet and that could be, uh, like I've already said, a presentation or a publication or, you know, a, a web publication, a blog post, uh, um, uh, we have an academic arch archive that undergraduates are able to submit their uh, um, papers to if they so choose, etc. Um, yeah, you can have your unpublished, unpeer-reviewed, undergraduate work uh, permanently archived for all the world to see. So think about that. All right, uh, and then I've, uh, yeah, that whole idea, um, I have a separate lecture about how uh, college students of today should be actively thinking about building their online presence and a portfolio so people so that they can be found and their good work and good thinking is available for people to find and certainly there's more kinds of content than just a paper about Shakespeare but it's not a bad thing to find somebody's uh, well-written 
claim about a, a literary text. All right, so um, building your own portfolio, that's all good. Okay, now what what I have on this, I just want to recap some, some general things I've discovered in the process of um, uh, presenting some of this information to my students and thinking about it a little bit over the last few days. And one of the things I wanted to point out again is just how um, informal this is, right? I, I did make sure that I could find things again by putting in you know, uh, uh, just enough of a reference that it could be found again, or perhaps a link to where I could find something, um, or or perhaps an author, you know, like I did a title and an author. This is not even close to being a complete MLA citation, but you don't want to be in the mode of complete documentation, because that will totally take you out of the moment. You just need the bare minimum so you can keep the flow of your thinking about ideas and connections going, and, and still be able to find that stuff later when, when you might actually need to fully document it. So it needs to be informal and it needs to be a bit random and it's okay to jump around from section to section. I think you saw how I jumped from secondary to primary sources and, and uh, how one can give you an idea for another and since it's all just in, a, in an endless Google doc, document you can you can jump around all you want. You know in, in some of the research projects that I've done is I've done this kind of pre-writing I've actually gone to a uh, wiki format. Uh, let me pull that up for you and show you just so that you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so I uh, was doing research on digital culture as I was teaching a class on, on digital culture and I spent a few months over the summertime really you know, boning up on that and figuring it out. And um, just to keep track of all the sources and everything I was talking about, I ended up creating a wiki. And a wiki is something where you can you can have um, all kinds of um, uh, different uh, topics that you give a separate page to and so I even started to start spelling out terminology and kind of made my own little knowledge base my own set of terms here and you know well, what is an algorithm and etc and I well it ties in with cybernetics and so I click to that and and even to things that are outside of my little site and so on so you can ramp this up and if you are doing a much bigger, bigger project like a master's thesis or a, a monograph or a dissertation or something like that, a single Google Doc is not going to do it for you. But, but even on modest sized projects, if you're comfortable creating a wiki and you can create a wiki for free going to sites.google.com, hint, use their classic sites and not their new ones because it's easier to make a wiki with those, but do what you want. anyway. If you're comfortable with making on-the-fly uh, website pages, which is so easy to do, I mean, I'll just show you how easy it is to do. I'm in the Google Sites here, and I just go up to the little pencil icon, and well, that's for editing a specific page, so that's not what I wanted to do. But if I wanted to hit the plus thing, suddenly I'm creating a new page, and it's like uh, whatever cool, to cool topic 27 is, and I might want to Put that into some specific uh, subordinate position among my wiki if I was going to do this and boom suddenly I have a new page and then I can start writing on that and then you could start establishing hyperlinks among the different pages now this can become you know a rabbit hole and end in itself and the goal here uh, unless you are creating a knowledge base and that is the publication uh, which, which this kind of ended up being um, Unless you're doing that, of course, you, you don't want to just spend all your time organizing your content. But what I am saying is that there's more than one way of organizing one's content digitally. Google Doc is a really simple way. Some people might do it with different worksheets in a, uh, uh, a Google Sheet or, you know, the Microsoft equivalent. Um, I'm just, uh, if you have never thought of using a wiki as a uh, way of keeping track of research, I recommend that you think about it. Because after you start doing a lot of research, it's hard to keep track of what you're, you're thinking about and then you have a, a way that you can um, if I forgot now where did I talk about cybernetics or where did I have that definition then I can search the whole site and it shows all of the pages that I used or I, that that particular term that can be very useful down the road now I'm not saying all my students need to go whole hog on this and create a huge wiki for a, a modest uh, 8 to 10 page research paper but I do want you to think in terms of finding the I do want you to think in terms of finding the appropriate digital tools to help you manage your uh, your research and, and 
And then going back to some of those general principles that you need to leave yourself some some breadcrumbs, which means a way of finding the trail back. And that might be finding the trail back to, um, remember at one point uh, when I, I, I found a source, I indicated where I found that source so I could go back to that particular place. Or when I'm looking at the primary sources, I was sure to um, uh, not only put a reference to the primary source, but part of the breadcrumb trail is my thinking. And this is, you know, a first level a sorting of my response to this passage is it, just to put a kind of label or a tag on it, or I could do a little longer explanation as I as I do on this one, and and that can also be very helpful in in helping you to to filter things. Now, what what happens when you start getting a, a critical mass of good ideas is they they start wanting to gravitate towards one another, and I've already seen this in some of my students. Uh, worksheets as they were sharing these today. One of the things that I saw several of them doing that I thought was really quite helpful was if you return to this possible themes and angles you can start grouping the things that really are in common and and so uh, let's see can I do this right now uh, obviously there's a madness and suicide thing and that's well that's pretty obvious right there um, but you, you see what I'm saying? You, you, you can just kind of go down, and it should be recursive this way. You should be going back to your list of possible themes and angles, and not at the very end of the process, but midway through the process, as you keep adding to it, you kind of go back and, and let some of it percolate and think it through a little bit, read through some of them, and ask yourself, are, are, are some of these things related to each other? They're going to be. It's inevitable. The mind wants to make things connect, and you'll find those connections. Anyway, um, I think that's enough to illustrate the point. You can start going through, I wouldn't overdo this and have multiple levels of subordination, but I do think if you have uh, a little bit of subordination and kind of starting to move things around into chunks of, of relevant questions that go with each other, that that could be very helpful. So another thing that I've observed in this is, it, and I didn't strictly follow this in my own listing of possible themes, themes or angles here, but it's often a good idea to state these in terms of a question okay so is love and madness something I want to write about well, okay you know that's kind of a quest question there um, uh, are madness and religion connected are they connected in Hamlet there's just something about stating it as a question that helps you on the quest so you know maybe this isn't good enough madness and music it, there's just not enough there um, so as I recall when I was thinking about it um, it's, I might have stated it this way, um, does music illustrate the madness or help to resolve it? Hmm? Yeah, see, see that's more interesting. So I just went from a kind of bland statement of a topic that I don't really know what's being predicated there to actually putting it into a sentence, into a question and that kind of makes me want to keep digging into it. All right. So consider recasting some of your listed items as questions and consider grouping some of your common um, topics together and, and to see what happens. But don't take this too far too quickly or else you'll ruin the um, effort of going broad by starting to go deep too soon. Uh, now students are, you know, they're pragmatic and I understand that, you know, you, you got to finally have a topic and have a claim and write your paper. But if you have spaced out your time and, and used a, a good development calendar and reserved for yourself a chance to do some brainstorming, a chance for you to do some researching, so you don't have to just run to the library before the deadline's over, then you can have the luxury and the pleasure of really kind of feeling your way towards what would I really like to like to, to write about. And if you take nothing else away from this, I hope it is that. Give yourself the time and means to really brainstorm, really explore, and then when it comes time to develop a strong claim, you're going to be a lot interest, more interested in doing it, a lot more eager to write about it if you have you know, 12 or 15 solid ideas and then you end up beefing up just a few of those and then you narrow it down to one and boom, you're on your way. So that's the vision I hope to give you. 
There are lots of ways to skin the cat, lots of ways that you could go about this uh, pre-writing or brainstorming process. I, I think these are a few good ones, and I encourage you to try them out, and then good luck moving on to the next stage of your paper.